but before long, I heard that the sewing centre was actually going to close down. Uh, they were really struggling in COVID. And the sewing centre itself had been set up by uh, a Brisbane-based charity as a training facility for young girls who had been rescued from trafficking or were at risk of trafficking. And it was an add-on to their uh, safe haven. They had a, a rescue home for these young women. And once they had left high school and needed to train in a trade, the sewing centre had been set up. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Lead Well, Live Well podcast, uh, where we have interesting conversations with uh, great leaders. And I've got a very interesting person today, someone I've known for over two decades uh, and uh, really excited to have her here. And um, she is the co-founder of Avadar Global, which is a, a social enterprise that does uh, garments uh, that are ethical and sustainable. Um, and also, uh, just to top that off, uh, employees people who have been uh, trafficked or at risk in Cambodia. So a phenomenal thing she does. And I've been super looking forward to this conversation with Liz Henderson. Liz, thanks for taking the time to come and uh, and say hello. It's a pleasure, Mark, to be here. It's good, good to see you. I always enjoy catching out, catching up with you. It's the same likewise, absolutely. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the social enterprise because I think that's kind of the core of, of what people would like to know about. But before that, you had a life before social enterprise. You did a lot of consulting, um, particularly around the strategy and performance management side of things. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the sort of work you were doing and the kinds of clients you were working with? Yeah, sure. So I was running a strategy consultancy first in New Zealand and then more recently in Australia. Uh, Vision-based strategy, working with large corporates, with government, universities and other tertiary organizations, uh, infrastructure companies, global software, even digital marketing agencies. So it was a very wide range of clientele uh, serving very different target markets. Yeah, some big companies in there. Yes. For sure. And, and do you think we do that well uh, in general, looking at um, strategic planning? Uh, I think we can improve. What I see frequently is a focus on creating a strategy document. And let's be frank, if you have a 20 page strategic plan, it's very difficult for people to follow it and implement it and report against it. And I think that's the whole purpose of strategy, is it not? Is Absolutely. that you are setting a direction, you're monitoring it, and you're able to say, we are successful or not. So I really push my clients to consider a strategy on a page, something that is evergreen because the external operating environment is complex and it's changing frequently. So it's not a set and forget exercise. And when I see the 20 pages, I, I often find them a year later gathering dust on an executive's shelf. I bumped into that so many times. I'm, I'm glad you said that, actually, <laughs> because, um, you know, we, we have an agile strategic planning process. Uh, and, and I think it's important that uh, things are uh, planned for and thought about, but key short set of priorities um, that's a, that can change over time because the environment changes so quickly. Exactly. I think one, of the, one of the challenges is just how fast things are changing. Um, it's a very dynamic environment. If you lock out the four kilo document of what we're going to do over the next 10 years, you're just going to be wrong after a few weeks. Mm, exactly right. And, you know, if you think back to uh, what we were considering even a couple of years ago to what we're looking at now with AI and other uh, trends that are completely transformational to so many sectors, uh, you know, and if, if your strategic plan is locked and loaded and not reviewed and, and refined as a living document, you're just not going to be able to cope with the changes that are coming to your sector. Absolutely. And they're huge. Yeah. I think that talks a little bit into culture as well. You know, if you have a if you have a dynamic environment where people are able to challenge the status quo and question things, uh, that, that seems to have be a more agile, flexible uh, environment. Do you think that's important for success in today's market? I certainly do. I think getting diverse opinions and stakeholder engagement, not at the end of a plan where you have a... Uh, you know, a finished document that you say, here's what we've done. Oh, here's where we're going. Can you rubber stamp it? But actually involving 
uh, stakeholders right across the organization and contributing to the strategic directions because they're going to bring insights that leadership and board may not have realized or have access to. Yeah. So I think it's uh, I think what we're seeing or what I'm seeing is um, a greater diversity of participant in the strategy process, right. and because of that. Uh, a more um, robust strategy evolving out of out of the process. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we've moved towards um, embracing more diverse teams and creating a safe environment where they can input. It obviously becomes mm. pretty pretty important. Mm. Um, so the sort of baited question a little bit is: How did you go from that kind of corporate life into doing a social enterprise? What what happened there? It well, all went terribly wrong. Like what, what's going on? <laughs> it all went terribly <laughs> wrong. Well, uh, quite a few things, um, let's say, were t- transformational in my life. Uh, we, we left uh, New Zealand as earthquake refugees from Christchurch moving to uh, Australia. And as I walked out of the country, I said, I am never going to do strategy consulting again. Mm. And uh, for a while, I didn't. I walked into uh, Urban Utilities, which is Australia's fourth largest water utility, and I had several senior uh, operational roles. And I have to say, as a strategist, it's really good to spend some time in the operational side of a business. Absolutely. Otherwise, you're always existing in the uh, a little bit in the stratosphere, yeah. and uh, it's a reality check to actually see. Uh, what's happening on the ground and to be part of that. So I was doing that for five and a half years. And uh, I'm an entrepreneur by background. So in New Zealand, my strategy consulting was through my own uh, enterprise. Uh, And after five and a half years of working in a larger organization, while I loved it, I had an entrepreneurial itch that wasn't getting scratched. And so I reignited my strategy consulting uh, and I took back, I ate my words that I had spoken as I left New Zealand. And uh, I found myself consulting over this side of the Tasman for some really interesting organizations. I stepped into an acting GM role at RACQ, which is, of course, yeah. uh, the Queensland equivalent to you know NRMA, uh, except they had a bank. So a very interesting organization to participate in. And then from there, I moved uh, into strategy consulting for um, some of the larger uh, faith-based organizations, which uh, one of which is is the largest employer outside of government in the state of Queensland. So some really interesting uh, strategic elements, if you like, uh, looking down a similar horizon, I suppose, to what the private sector is facing, but with that uh overlay of a very large workforce and the impacts of some of these we've talked about ai but what are the yeah. technology trends uh, economic uh, environmental and other that are impacting that sector so that was my foray i suppose into more community development uh, but i have to say this co-foundership into a uh, social enterprise that kind of landed in my lap i was not going about thinking I'm going to be setting up a social enterprise. I was quite happy doing my yep. uh, consulting on the side. So what's the story behind that? How did that happen? Well, it happened that um, I've always had a couple of businesses going, even in New Zealand when I had consulting. I also ran, uh, owned, founded, set up and ran three ladies fitness centers. So I had my brain business and my brawn business, as I called it. And so when I reinstigated my consulting life in Australia, after a few months, I was thinking, gee, I really need a side hustle. Mm. So I actually bought an e-commerce maternity activewear business, which is kind of funny because if you could see me, you'd know that I'm well beyond the maternity activewear part of life. Anyway... Um, and so, but I thought, here's the, here's something that's a little bit different. I need to understand and learn how to do e-commerce. So I'll buy a business. Some people go on courses. I buy the business. Okay. Uh, and, uh, in September, that was September, 2019. No one, none of us knew what was coming a few months later. Yeah, that's good timing. Yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> this business had been set up by a couple of, um, Sydney moms 
and they had been manufacturing their activewear in Sydney. And I thought, that's great, but I would really like to use this venture as an opportunity to uh, do some good. So I went on a discovery trip to um, Vietnam and Cambodia in October and November of 2019 to find a sewing center that could take over the manufacturing of these leggings, but do so in a way that was supporting women, uh, vulnerable women. And ironically, I went and visited this particular sewing center in Phnom Penh, never imagining that uh, less than 18 months later, I'd actually be owning it. But they were uh, very impressive, and I thought, yes, I will. I think I will move my manufacturing from Sydney to this particular entity. Um, fast forward a few, well, several months, mm. and of course, COVID hit. It was not really feasible or possible to, to get my next order of production done over there. Uh, but before long, I heard that the sewing center was actually going to close down. Uh, they were really struggling in COVID. And the sewing center itself had been set up by uh, a Brisbane-based charity as a training facility for young girls who had been rescued from trafficking or were at risk of trafficking. And it was an add-on to their uh, safe haven. They had a, a rescue home for these young women. And once they had left high school and needed to train in a trade, the sewing center had been set up. In fact, it had been set up by the person who was to become my business partner. And I actually met her while I was in Cambodia back in October of 2019. Anyway, both of us started to uh, consider what would it look like if we took over the sewing center because it closing an entity like that in COVID, at that time, of course, there's no job keeper, job seeker for people left uh, unemployed in the pandemic in Cambodia. Yeah. So what what could we do? And uh, call us crazy, but we decided to step in and, and buy it. So I tell people, and this is absolute truth, that we bought a failing factory in the middle of a pandemic in a country we couldn't visit that had no customers. Okay. Yeah, wow. Well, that's a big call, isn't it, really, at the end of the day? You must have had a real vision for what it could be in the future. We did. And the thing is, my business partner, Corrine, she had actually set this sewing center up, as I said, for this charity. And that was back in 2016. She had trained the original staff mm. to work to export quality. And so it was, we saw it as a real tragedy that was going to close down. And if we could step in and actually save it, mm. albeit from afar, we wanted yeah. to, to, uh, to do that. So we 2021 we we bought it and uh we hadn't gone into 2021 at least i hadn't thinking i'm going to be buying a, 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 a entity in another country so pretty much wiped out the savings mm. and we thought well now what are we going to do uh we had staff that we had to pay wages for we had to give them something to do and of course in the garment industry it can take three or four months to actually onboard a customer by the time you you know you made a sample and they've approved it and you've ordered fabric and then you've made the stuff yeah. um <clears throat> so we did a gofundme campaign and the theme of the campaign was the most expensive t-shirt you'll ever buy campaign <laughs> And essentially, I love that. That's great. Yeah. Well, essentially, if you gave us over a hundred Australian do dollars, we promised you at some vague point in the future, the four or five months from that point, that we would send you a very plain looking t shirt from Cambodia. Mm. Quality, of course, made with love. Yes. Uh, and the tagline of this campaign was most expensive t shirt you'll ever buy, yep. but the most valuable you'll ever own because it's kept a worker employed in the pandemic. Absolutely. And that kept us going for the next few months and we were able to onboard some real customers. Mm. So what does, it, um, what does it mean to someone who comes and works for you in the background that they've come from? It's life-changing. So yeah. just uh, to, to give your listeners the story of one of our workers, um, I won't call her by her real name, let's call her Sono. She was, um, she was left in the care of a neighbour but while her single mom worked long hours in a in an exploitive garment factory in in Cambodia, and she was left in the she and her 
older sister were left in the care of a neighbor who groomed and abused them. Very person tasked with caring for her was taking advantage of them. Thankfully, in Sono's case, she was rescued by a local rescue agency and she was given a safe haven place to live, to go to school and uh, all the counseling and trauma support. And when she graduated high school, she actually joined our team as a sewer while she did her university degree part time. That's great. Yeah. And I'm pleased to say that the start of last year, we were able to promote her from the production line mm. into management because she's doing a management degree. That's great. And so, you know, the story, the, what we tell those entities, those companies and organizations that manufacture their uniforms or their fashion brands or whatever with us is that her success is actually their story. Yeah. So the, it is absolutely transformational, not just for her, but... For every person we employ, they say that another five or six are benefiting economically yeah. from that uh, that work situation. Mm. And over 80% of our staff have come from below the poverty line. That's amazing. Yeah. So you're really having an impact. On we are progress. having an impact. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's not without its challenges, of I'm course. Sure. Uh, but... You know, we're seeing we're seeing the success. So we started with a seven back in 2021. We now nearly quadrupled the staff to uh, to 26. We had zero customers when we took it over. We've now got over 50 uh, organizations that work with us. Our customer base is mainly in Australia, but we also have U.S. based okay, nice. customers. And recently, we've just acquired a, a European customer with another one in the pipeline. Okay. Uh, we make everything from Corporate wear to active wear, swim wear, medical scrubs, even bed linen. Yeah. So small run, high quality. Because sometimes there's a bit of a misnomer, isn't there, around social enterprises and, and quality? There is. So quality is one of the, uh, well, it's one of our values yeah. in terms of, you know, excellence. Uh, but it's also part of our, uh, you know, our, our production um system so we not only have what we call inline quality assurance where as we're actually cutting and making something there is someone whose job it is to check the quality but then we have um end of production uh quality assurance and then we have a final quality assurance when it's ready to ship so we we do these three different stages of quality assurance because uh that's what we're selling is the quality i love that and I, I do like the, the the social enterprise model. I think, you know, having uh, a reason for being that actually makes a difference in the local community, whatever that might be, mm. um, and yet deliver a product that's commercial and people aren't dealing with you primarily because of what your outputs are. It's yeah. more about the commercial realities. And that, that, that conjoining of those two worlds, I think, is it's hard to do well. So you've obviously done a great job in, in bringing those two things together. We're trying to do that. Uh, so we we are we say that we are for purpose and we are for profit. Yep. However, our profit goes back in, to reinvest into building the training uh, programs so that we can. We want our workers to thrive at home and at work. So although we are what well, garment manufacturing is what we do, we yep. are in effect a people development company. So not Love only it. are they learning technical companies competencies but we're teaching them you know how to manage their money uh health and wellness uh, uh we've identified 20 soft skills if you like that we want to see them flourish in uh, how to manage difficult conversations how to make good decisions how to be resilient uh punctual uh, all those kind of good work practices that actually um if you haven't worked in a positive work culture you may not actually have yeah, absolutely. And developing your people gives you a better outcome as well, which is great. Exactly. For sure. I love that. Um, the more astute, audible people would have noticed that you are not from these parts. Do you want to give us a bit of background of uh, where you've come from and how you've ended up in Australia? Yes, by a very long and circuitous yes. route. So um, my accent is Canadian, so I'm Canadian by, by birth. Uh, I have lived in... Five continent on five continents in seven countries, uh, and uh, I'll just want to say Australia is now home. And uh, while I will visit other places, this is it. I'm not moving again. <laughs> You're done. 
That's yes. famous last words, isn't it? You'll be moving somewhere. Yeah, it's a bit like, yeah, I'm never doing consulting again as yes. I left New yes. Zealand. Yeah, so I, yes. So my first job out of uh, university was teaching maths and science in the middle of the Kalahari Desert. Wow. In Botswana. Um, yeah, so that really set the tone, I think, for my, yeah. my journey through life. Yeah. So I was, uh, the village they posted me in was two days along a sand trail. So literally the paved road Amazing. ended and unless you had a big Bedford, you know, cattle truck or four wheel drive, you couldn't actually get to the village. And when I arrived in this village as a 23 year old from Montreal, well, Montreal was a city of 3 million people at the time, a pretty sophisticated. Uh, so there I arrived and there was no electricity, no running water except in a village standpipe and I'd have to fetch my water in a bucket. Uh, no telephones and deep sand everywhere. Amazing. Yeah. There was a great no way paper. to start your career. Yeah. Great, great introduction to yeah. uh, full-time working life. Yeah, I love uh, that. And of course, I wasn't a trained teacher, apparently, because I had a science degree that qualified me to teach uh, Form 1s, maths and science. So oh. poor kids, they, uh, they were the guinea pigs as I figured out how to impart these lessons to them. Awesome. And your next step was from where to where? Where did you go from there? Um, I went back to Canada, did a Master's of International Development. Having spent the two years in the middle of the Kalahari, I was absolutely fascinated mm. by the, you know, how communities evolved uh, and, and how developing nations can be brought uh, forth economically. So I did a degree, ended up traveling to Tanzania for my master's thesis, which was on uh, alternative energy for rural development, particularly looking at biogas, which is really interesting because when I fast forward, I'm just going to sort of yeah. do a little digression here. But yep. when I ended up working at the water utility, one of my uh, last roles there, I was actually uh, responsible for a team that was looking at biogas technology uh, and how how to um to use biogas for uh, energy production. In that case, right. in the water utility, it was uh, working with products destined for destruction from um, one of the big uh, soft drink manufacturers. Okay. I don't need to name them. People probably figure out who they were. Yeah. Uh, and taking that sweet product and putting it in a sewage treatment plant, bio di biogas digester, producing uh, electricity from that uh, process with a cogen and so on, which then powered the sewage treatment plant, but also powered some of the vehicles that the water utility used to, to get around town. So you got to use your so degree. So many years later, yeah. uh, after I'd done this uh, master's thesis, I was able to uh, actually implement it in, in the workplace. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so getting back to yeah Tanzania uh, and then um, I... I had met my husband in Africa and uh, we'd gone our own ways, but long story, which I won't go into here, we uh, ended up coming together, getting married. And because Botswana was the common territory to both of us, he's Scottish, I'm Canadian, we went back. Yeah, and he's a good guy. I like Paul. Yeah, yeah, he's okay. He's, I'll, right. I'll, I'll, he's a keeper. I've he's a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> good to know, good to know. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember how many decades now we've been married but it's a big number now yeah um <clears throat> yeah so after that we ended up going back to the uk uh from there both of us got i think a bit of itchy feet so after six years in the uk and um by then we had three babies three kids we moved to borneo and uh he was teaching in uh brunei yeah and i was raising kids but i ended up working for doing some contract work for an educational management firm, actually the one that had placed him there, but also working for the Canadian High Commission, doing some nice. some business reports for them to, yeah, give them an ins uh, give Canadian business businessmen and, and women an insight into investing and working in 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 Brunei. Uh, by that point, we're in our late thirties. We've got three kids, and we figured we actually, you know, Brunei was great, but we really need to settle somewhere, and uh, it was. Uh, actually through Paul's school, he, he uh, was teaching in a, believe it or not, because Brunei, of course, is an all, uh, is a Muslim country. He was teaching in an all girls school mm. and there were two other Western men in the school. Both of them were Kiwis. Right. And they were really impressive mm. and their families were really impressive. And we looked at these guys and thought, hmm, 
If that's the kind of people that New Zealand sends overseas, it must be a pretty good place. So long story short, we ended up applying for permanent residency in New Zealand. And of course, you know, the way we operate, we hadn't even visited the country at that point, got permanent residency and then went right. and visited. Yep. And we were there for 14 years until uh, we ended up leaving mm. because of the Christchurch earthquakes and yeah. coming across here. Like all yeah. good Kiwis, you've moved to Australia. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, I have to say some of the best Australians I've met are Kiwis. Um, but, yeah, and look, to be fair, some of the best Australians I've met are also Australians. That's right. <laughs> Few and far between, but I know what you mean. It's rugby season, so, you know, I tend to get a bit partisan at this time of the yeah, year. I, I, yeah, I do feel that too, yeah. yeah. Um, so, look, you've, you've had such an interesting background, corporate um, and, and all these different leadership experiences in multinational environments. Um, what have you learned about how to be a leader? Do you have any kind of key philosophies or, or key things that um, help you be a good leader? I, I, I think I had to learn to be a leader on the job and I don't think I was a great leader when I started out because I can be quite directional and solutions minded. Yep. You know, I blame it on my, my science upbringing. Uh, however, I think I soon became aware as I, as I was called to lead teams and then, um, you know, as, as I was GM of uh, c customer and community at the water utility, which so I had uh, 76 people under me, which was probably the largest I've ever had in terms of team. So I had several layers of teams and team leaders uh, mm -hmm. reporting up through to me. And I think what I learned that is respecting people, listening to them, empowering them, encouraging them is the most powerful thing you can do. So it's not that correction doesn't take place, mm. but if you can do it in what I call a, a Socratic fashion, where you're, you're asking the questions and helping them come to the conclusions, it's a far better way than how I originally started out, which was, here, let me tell you how to do it. <laughs> I like that. And it takes a little bit of wisdom, doesn't it, to ask the right questions, coach people through. Uh, but I love what you said about respect. I think that's such a foundational principle for for good leaders. If we um, we have a culture of honor and respect for people regardless of their roles, I think it goes a long way mm. to generating loyalty and connection. Um, what about the um, strategic side of things and leadership? Do you have a, a sort of philosophy around strategy and leadership and how those two things come together? I think strategy strategy doesn't work unless you have uh, healthy leadership, yeah. healthy, authentic, and vulnerable leadership. Uh, otherwise, it's just a nice idea, yeah, a dream that never gets implemented. And and you know, it's the the old saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm. So the strategy isn't good until it's actually done. And and if people don't feel like they have been part in the creation of the strategy, they're going to be less inclined to want to do it, yeah, particularly when it's calling for change in their areas. Yeah. So a lot of strategy is transformational. It's requiring change. It's pe requiring people to uh, move in a direction maybe they're not comfortable with. And so how do you work beside them and allow them to, to make that journey in a way that's safe for them? Mm. Uh, but ultimately is is benefiting the organization. And it's not always an easy answer. No. Because sometimes you have to say, no, this is the way we're going to have to do it. Yep. This is, um, but I think the more information that you can give people. So we did things when we had to go through transformation at the water utility. You know, I had a rumor box. And if you heard something, Love you'd it. put it in the rumor box. Mm. And th then every day that box would be emptied. And it was all the whisperings. Yeah, great. Love because that. when when we always, as leaders, we always think we're communicating enough when change is afoot, but we're never communicating enough. So the rumor box, we could see what people were actually thinking, what they were believing, you know, truth, not truth. Yeah. And we would be able to respond and stick it up on the wall. And so it was very anonymous. Nobody knew who'd said it, but it was acknowledged and it was responded to and gave people a bit of certainty because that's you, great. I love that. Yeah. That's a great idea, isn't it? Because I think if people, um, if you, if you're not transparent, they'll assume the worst anyway, so you might as well have it out there. Yeah. I think it's a great way to capture yeah. that, 
uh, transparency, people and what they help to create. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a good way good way to do it. Uh, so the, this podcast is Lead Well, Live Well. Uh, and those, it's a hard contrast, I think, as leaders. We're busy, a thousand things going on. Do you have anything um, that you would you could give to people as far as helping them if they're in busy leadership positions to sort of lead and have a life? Do you have anything that you do to um, try and bring some balance into that? I think as a leader, you you run your schedule and it, you have to be intentional. So stopping work when uh, at the end of the day is really important and really asking yourself, is this today's work or is this tomorrow's work? This is very easy to try and work on into the evenings. Yeah. So I think being very structured and intentional about your time, but also I think exercise, that's a yeah, really great. big thing. Yep, absolutely. Makes a big difference, doesn't it, mentally as well if, we, yeah. if we're uh, keeping keeping physical. Um, and uh, I like what you're saying around the, the diary piece, like the scheduling, locking in, putting in boundaries, managing that and making sure that there's time for work and time for play. Mm. Liz Henderson. Fantastic. Really enjoyed talking to you today. Thanks for, for taking the time to, to spend some time with us today. I've truly enjoyed it. Thank That's you, fair. Mark. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on another episode from the Lead Well, Live Well podcast. Thanks for your company. Please like and subscribe. It really helps support the channel if you do that. If you're a business leader and you have an interest in strategy and culture, leadership, then please join us at our website, leadwelllivewell.com. All those links will be in the description below. Until next time, thanks for watching.